Acts 17 is where we will begin. Acts 17. I'm going to teach from PowerPoint this morning, something that I do very seldom, but when I do, it's because what I have to bring, I want you to see it with your eyes. You have to see it with your eyes. So, the most famous rabbi on the planet, known literally today by billions of people, was a guy that lived 2,000 years ago. Now, the ultimate rabbi of rabbis is the Lord himself, but I'm speaking humanly. That would be the Apostle Paul. He wrote half the New Testament documents, maybe just a little less than half. There are billions of people on the planet that call themselves Christians, and I'm not being ugly, but you know, not everybody that just says, Lord, Lord, is a born-again child of God. But that means they're probably at least vaguely familiar with the Scriptures. Oh, I hope so. So they know about the Apostle Paul. So billions, there's never been a rabbi that's ever lived, that billions and billions and billions of people have known him, and his name has lived on for thousands of years. Never We have access to his heart and his mind because a half of the New Testament documents are his. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he pours out his heart and his mind. You see his personality. Um, he doesn't have a big S on his chest. He doesn't wear holy underwear. <laughs> He's just a guy who was zealously promoting the Orthodox Jewish way and promoting himself and promoting the Sanhedrin and promoting the rabbinical class because he was working his way up to be a Sanhedrin judge. So one of the ways that he did it was he got papers after the church was born from the authorities, the religious authorities, to hunt down primarily Jewish people who were giving their lives to Yeshua HaMashiach, Adonai. He hunted them down. He put them in jail, brutally abused them. Some of them he either killed and or had killed. I doubt if he put his hand on it, but he, it was because of his work that people died. He was on a journey to do that again. We read about in the book of Acts, we call it the Damascus Road experience. He was on the way to Damascus from Jerusalem. And there the risen Lord appeared to him, struck him down in front of witnesses. The witnesses didn't see what he saw, kind of like Stephen when he was being stoned, the first deacon. Um, and that doesn't mean he was token. It means he was being stoned to death with rocks. And he looked up and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. I see the heavens. I see the throne of God. And it infuriated the religious elite because they couldn't see it. They didn't have eyes to see. But Stephen is dying. Same thing with Paul. When he was struck down, he thought he was dying. It took three days before he finally saw the light and his eyes were open. He was blinded for three days. God does some amazing things in three days. <laughs> he sent an elderly Jewish believing man to him, Ananias, who said, Paul, you got to know what's happened to you, man. It's time to quit killing Christians and join them. Paul was saved and baptized. Over years, he ministered throughout the Roman Empire. Over years, he discipled one people to the Lord, discipled men and women, discipled several men, Timothy and Titus, or in the scriptures we know about, to be pastors. He wrote letters to him. We call those the pastoral letters because he's writing letters to these guys that he led to the Lord and he raised them up in the Lord and he raised them up to be pastors and they're pastors of significant churches in their day. That's the Apostle Paul and there's so much more. Before he was saved, he was flamboyant, 
outspoken, a little sarcastic, and a little crass. But after he was saved, he was flamboyant, outspoken, a little sarcast, sarcasm, sarcastic, and crass. But now it was all covered in the anointing of God, and it was used to fervently preach the gospel and to show people the deep mysteries and secrets of God's word. Well, see, what, you know, a lot of people listening would be saying, oh, mysteries and secrets. The Bible's not about all that. Well, excuse me. From Old Testament and New Testament, God himself says, Behold, I will show you mysteries that you have never seen before, so that in the day you see them, in the day I reveal them, you cannot say, I already knew that. Paul, he says, Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. And he talks about the rapture. Behold, I'll tell you the mystery of Christ in God and God in the house of God. I'll tell you the mystery. And I'm paraphrasing, but, they, but he goes on to explain all of that. The mystery, the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. Well, that's cool because he was a rabbi. <laughs> he studied the scriptures. And in the day of the early church, until these New Testament documents started circulating around, a bunch of them were Paul's, um, the scriptures, whenever you hear it says Paul showed them from the scriptures, it's talking about what we would call the Old Testament. The Jewish people call it the Tanakh. That's where he would show them. He would show them from the word of God, the scriptures, and in there he would show them Jesus, Yeshua, and the whole plan of salvation and everything that God was doing from the beginning. Acts chapter 17 is one example of about seven or eight that are found in the New Testament when either Paul gives his testimony or someone writes about his ministry. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they, that would be Paul and his missionary entourage in the Roman Empire, had passed through, and these are two Greek cities, Amphipolis and Apollyana, they, they are in the area of what's now modern-day Greece. And then they came to Thessalonica, again, in modern-day Greece where there was a Jewish synagogue. Jewish synagogues were all over the Roman Empire with just a few exceptions. As his custom was, and I'm going to add the words, now as a born-again believer, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days there in Thessalonica, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you as the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews in the synagogue were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks who were in those synagogues, claiming that they were now of the Jewish faith. And also, not a few prominent women. And I know if we just put the period and stop there, we'd say, man, that is so great. Look at the next sentence. But the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob. That sounds like political parties today, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds like, I mean, you, it's so hard to get just man to man, woman to woman. Now somebody's got to have a mob behind them. And usually that's a sign of jealousy or rage. We see it here again formed a mob, and they started a riot in the city. I'm so glad we don't have riots all over America with mobs. All over the world. Nothing has changed in the heart of mankind, of humankind. Just technology is the only thing that's changed. Now we can do it quicker, (laughs) and we can do it around the globe (laughs) instantaneously. We can take our riots and our mobs, we can film them, we can put them on the internet, they'll stay there until the Lord comes back. And I'm sure God's going to show those again at the great white throne of judgment. Anyway, that's another sermon. I can't wait to get into this. Let me share with you what I'm going to do this morning. I, uh, months and months and months and months ago, I went through a series two or three Sunday mornings over about I don't know, about a month, 
I mean, I didn't do them every Sunday, but over about a month, I did two or three messages where I used PowerPoint that looks similar to this. In fact, you're going to see some slides, just a few from those, because I need to set up a foundation to go where we're going to go this morning, which will be a, a newer message or a new message for this church from me. And, and I showed you how Genesis 1, verse 1, the first book, the first verse. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'eretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I showed you how that is directly linked throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament to prophecies in some of it in hidden mysterious code, but now it's all there for the whole world to see. Some of it plainly, but they didn't have eyes to see because what they were looking at, Christ had not come yet and they didn't understand. But after he did, they looked at their scriptures and saw the very letters that were used in the ancient Hebrew. We call it the Paleo-Hebrew. I'll talk about that in a moment. That the Bible was written in. And there before their eyes were pictures of the whole Christ event, pictures that the letters made. You'll see some of that this morning. Most of you have seen a bunch of it as I did this, but this morning I'm going to show you something else. It's amazing. The Word really is alive. And that Word really did become flesh. And that Word really was with God and was God at the same time in the beginning. He really was. There's no other book in the world that does the things that I showed you there and that I'm getting ready to show you now. None. It's because this word is anointed and this word has a purpose, one singular thematic purpose. Jesus had to go to the cross and rise from the dead so that we could sit here this morning and say, thank you for saving me. Saving me from what? From the judgment that's on its way. There's no other book in the world like it. There's no other savior in the world like it. There's no other name like Yeshua HaMashiach, Adonai. No other. Now, I'm going to take you on a journey. Okay, first page. All right, now let me just say, the first six or seven pages, um, most of you have seen before, but I've got to show these as the foundation so that people that are guests this morning will get that they can join right in with you and get it from the beginning. As well as remember, this is being videoed, and so it will be archived all over the internet. So I want people that watch it for the first time, maybe this is the first time they've ever seen anything like this, I want them to have the same foundation. So, home folks, thank you for your patience. Now, let me say this. You're going to be pummeled with a lot of Hebrew words this morning. Don't worry about that. You don't have to memorize them. You don't have to know them. Um, you, you, but they're going to be explained and they're going to be put in context of the journey that we're on. I promise you, if you'll just pay attention, I know you will, you're going to love what you see. And I think it will deeply impact your life. I think there will be some that will even come to the Lord today. I think there will be others that will come back to the Lord because of what you're getting ready to see. Now, again, I've said all that, so let me move quickly through the first six, five or six, uh, seven slides because these um, set up the foundation. All right, so you can read them as well, and most of you have. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you, the thing to know is the proto-synatic script, that's, you can get on the Internet and check all this out. That's the first alphabet that we know of in the whole planet, <laughs> It is about 2000 BC, and, and it's related to the Hebrew language. In fact, the Hebrew language came out of it, but also so did the Greek language and other languages of the world even today. As a matter of fact, the first letter was called Aleph, and the second letter was called Bet, where we get the word alphabet. Everybody with me? Okay, so this is... And it was all born in, in the Middle East, the cradle of civilization. Now, the Paleo-Hebrew, of course, that just means the ancient Hebrew. See, we, we, we see modern Hebrew now when we see Hebrew language. And you'll, I'll have most of it written in modern Hebrew. Um, and, and then I'll give you the English translation and even pronunciation um, as good as I can. 
Okay, so the Paleo Hebrew script, that's the original alphabet of the Old Testament. It was about a thousand years BC. So the Old Testament, the Tanakh, was written in what we call the Paleo Hebrew. Now, here's some examples. All right, this would be the Proto Sinaitic A. Oh, no, excuse me, not the A, the Aleph and the Ta. That would be the first letter and the last letter. It doesn't correspond exactly to the English alphabet, so forgive me when I said A. But the Aleph and the Ta. Now, isn't that interesting? The Aleph was formed in the shape of an ox head. You know, that, so that letter itself became significant because all of the ancient, the, the Proto-Sinaitic and the Paleo-Hebrew letters, they had sounds, and from those sounds they could make words, and from words they could literally write books and poems, and so all of that was born back then, way back then. And, but they had not only sounds and made words, but each letter also had what we call ideograms. They had little meanings, little ideas, and I'm going to show you this from modern scholarship and modern media that acknowledge this, just in case somebody might think, well, I don't, I don't think they really had all that. Yes, they did, and they still do today, and I'll show you examples of it. But anyway, that's important. But so then, by the time the Bible was written, this is how the ox head looked, and that's how the tav looked. Now, what do you see here? The ox head that represents God, why? The most powerful, the first, the greatest, the biggest. And in agricultural society, if you had oxen, you were rich. You were powerful. They were the John Deere's and the four-wheel drive pickup trucks, okay? And back then, you didn't have a Publix you could go to or whatever, you know. You, you, <laughs> you raised your food or you got it from somebody that did, and you were so glad they had oxen, okay? So it, that represented God. If you just wanted to, to represent the name of God with one letter, there are actually two letters in the alphabet that do that very nicely, but this one was the first one you would do. The last letter of the alphabet, but the Tav, it's in the shape of a crucifixion cross. 2,000 years before Christ. And then by the time the Bible was written, the Paleo, that changed very little. It just had a little bit of a lean to it. And I'm going to show you art of archaeological remains that you can see with your own eyes and see that I'm not making this stuff up. All right? Now, modern Hebrew, the letters are shaped like this, the Aleph and the Ta. They look nothing really like e any of this. And this is okay, but I want you to know what these look like because the, this right here and all of the other letters that had those, the shapes of the paleo is what the ancients would have seen in the scripture. Okay? Then, of course, by the time you get to the New Testament, a lot of it, most of it written in Greek, but in the Revelation, Jesus said of himself, I am the Aleph, excuse me, the Alpha and the Omega. That corresponds, he's saying, I am the Aleph and the Ta. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't say it in Hebrew or Aramaic, but written in Greek so the world could see it back in those days. Now, in Isaiah, God himself says, I'm the first and the last. And that's another way of saying, I'm the Aleph and the Ta. I'm the first letter and the last letter, and I'm everything in between. And then, of course, Revelation, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. So Jesus claims that he is God who went to the cross. Look at what that picture, you just put those two together, and the ideograph, the ideogram is the first letter. It's just got the sound like ha, ha, or ah, okay? That's all. But it means God, the first, the greatest, the most powerful. Tav is in the shape of a cross. It means the covenant. But when you put them together, what's the message that's there? God, who made a covenant with humanity by going to the cross. Jews from different places of the world, but anyway... The hay, there's two of them. The ideogram is, behold, look at this. The yud is the hand. The vav is the nails. It can also be used to mean the spear. Behold the hands. Behold the nails. Behold the spear. That's my name. 
Yahweh. Are you following me? Do you see? You want to know who I am? You want to know who I am? Behold the hands. Behold the nails. That's some cool stuff. All right, I've already taught all this before. Let me move along. I, I can get bogged down, but let me be careful. Second, second slide, okay, or third. It'll say three. Okay. There, in, in, here, here is one of the oldest artifacts of the Paleo-Hebrew we have. There's the ancient Tav. There it is blown up, just like I told you. There's another one. There's the ancient Aleph, okay? So, and it's from one of the most famous archaeologists, and it's all down here. It's called the Siloam Inscription, and, and, and um, you can see it on the Internet, and there's the address. But that's one of, it's, 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 a, it's a narrative about the building of Hezekiah's tunnel in the days when Jerusalem was being seized. But I just want you to see those Paleo-Hebrew, it was written in Paleo-Hebrew. And there are two tabs you can see with your eyes. I, I'm not making this up. It's in the shape of a cross and the olive. Okay, turn the page. Okay, so of course we know that Jesus said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, which means the Aleph and the Ta. And Hebrew reads from right to left, so, so from right to left, so you can see there's the Aleph, there's the Ta, the Aleph and the Ta. He's also known as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 and 1 Peter 1. Everybody with me so far? Turn, turn the page. So there it is. Bereshit bara Elohim. Et. I'll tell you what that means in just a moment. Hashamayim et ha'eretz. In the beginning. God created. Actually, it says in the beginning, in Hebrew, it says in the beginning created God, the heavens and the earth. Now look at this. Right in the middle is, an, is a word. It's the Aleph Ta. Right in the middle. There are seven words in Genesis 1.1. When we say it in English, there are ten words. Seven is the number of completion and perfection. In the middle of it all is the Alpha, the Omega. That's Greek. Or the Aleph and the Tal. God says, I am the first and the last. Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Tal. In the first verse, we find who he says he is. Now, I need to say this. That particular combination of letters as the Et or the Et, it is found 11,000 times in the Old Testament. It is the accusative case grammar marker in Hebrew. We don't have that in uh, English, so it's a little difficult to understand. I'm not here to teach you Hebrew grammar, but I just want you to know that I know what I'm talking about here because some would be watching this, and if I don't say this, they're going to say, you're ignorant. You don't even know what that's there for. That's not Jesus. Well, actually it is. He said, I am the Aleph and the Ta, right? God says, I'm the first and the last, meaning I am the Aleph and the Ta. So he does say it. So there is a picture of Jesus right there out of Jesus' own mouth, out of God's own mouth. I'm God who became Yeshua, okay? And look, there's the cross, okay? Now watch. <laughs> right in the middle of it. Turn the page. But what you don't know is there's a Ta in the beginning, there's another ta, and look, there's an aleph ta. I'll explain that at the end. Right in the middle is another ta. It's three crosses. There's three crosses with Jesus in the middle. In the first sentence, a picture of Golgotha. Now, the ancients would not have seen that because to them that was just a letter. But after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, it freaked a lot of the Jewish people out. Golgotha. And again, I show you the rock just to make sure you see. Now, watch this. This is the word and. Now, this is cool. But the word and is made from the Aleph and the Ta, that's Jesus, if you will, and the Vav or the Wa, which means the spikes, the nails. Watch this. Jesus, with spikes through his body, is hanging between the heavens and the earth. On a cross. But he is the middle one of the three that were crucified that day. One, two, three. 
Okay. We, you haven't seen anything yet. This is repeat stuff. Turn the page. All right. There's something else I want to show you before we move to exactly what we're going to talk about. Revelation, many of you know this in the first chapter. In the middle of the seven lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, wrapped around his chest with a golden sash. All right? There's the image we get from that. Turn the page. Genesis 1.1. There's the seven lampstands. Jesus is the one in the middle. It represents the light of God's glory in the tabernacle, and it also represents the three on the cross. On and on and on. I've done, well, my, my latest book, and I'm not here to sell a book, so I'm not even going to say the title for the sake of everybody watching, but my latest book has all of this and so much more in it, but not what I'm getting ready to show you. Um, so that kind of sets a foundation. Um, Turn the page. Okay, our focus today is on Genesis 1-1, and we'll lightly refer to this, but we're going to focus in hard on the first word, bershit. Bershit, it's really one word with a preposition in front of it. The preposition is the letter bet, okay, alpha, aleph, bet, okay, that's the bet, I've got it read and magnified, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. This is reshit, which means the beginning. This means as a preposition, in, in the beginning. But it shows as one word in Hebrew. Is everybody with me? Again, you don't have to memorize all this. You don't have to know the names or the words. Just, just watch and listen with your eyes. Take this in by the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? The reason it's magnified... In the writing of today, like right there, it's not magnified. In writing of today's modern Hebrew, you won't see it, but in the scrolls of the Torah, even in the synagogues today, in those scrolls, and all the way back, some say, to Mount Sinai, the scribes would write certain letters with magnification. We would call it capitalization, but it, capitalization denotes something in English that's like, you know, it's a proper noun or whatever. That's not what this is about, though. What this says is, you need to look closely at this. There's a mystery. There's a secret here. Are you following me? Now, I'm going to prove that to you in just a moment, but the, think of this. You open the page of the scriptures, the first book, the first verse, the first letter says, you need to look closely at this. Well, you've already seen some of the mysteries and secrets that they could not have known until after the crucifixion. Is everybody with me? But just wait to what you see this morning. All right, turn the page. Let me just prove to you. This comes from Kabad.org. It's extremely orthodox Jewish. It is the largest and the oldest Orthodox Jewish website. And here's what they say. They say, although you cannot tell from the translations, if you look at a Torah scroll of the first five books, certain letters are written larger or smaller than the rest of the letters. These letters have been carefully copied by scribes in a chain of tradition that, according to some, can be traced all the way back to Mount Sinai. According to the sages, these letters hint to deeper meanings and secrets of the Torah. There's the address in case you want to go look at this for yourself. I know you know I'm not lying to you, but, you know, just to be um, integrity-filled about everything I'm teaching you this morning. So there's the word Bereshit. It's made up of these Hebrew letters, the Bet, the Resh, the Aleph, the Shin, the Yud, and the Tav, a cross. Isn't that interesting? That's where the first cross in the first verse, that's where we find it. Okay, turn the page. Now, th you got to know this. Um, as I said, there were ideograms for each letter. I'm sorry, it's a little shoved left. That's my fault. I'm sorry. But anyway, um, over here, you'll see the modern Hebrew. And I've just got circles around letters we're going to be talking about. Again, you don't have to pay super attention to that. It's just kind of for me. And then this shows you these are the meanings. So you have the ancient alphabet, the alphabet that the Bible was written in. And then you can see the progression. And here are some of the meanings, not all of them, but that's a bunch of them so you can see. So you have the proto-synatic there. Then you have the paleo. 
Hebrew, there. Haaretz is the Israel's oldest newspaper. It's like the New York Times of Israel. In fact, the New York Times in New York, there are an awful lot of Orthodox Jews that live there, selling in the same boxes that the New York Times is in on the streets is, a, is the Haaretz. Okay? Haaretz comes right from Genesis 1-1, by the way. It means the earth or the land. Okay? The land of Israel. So that's how they named their newspaper, Haaretz, the land. Everybody with me? You kind of get a little Hebrew lesson here, too. We've got Hebrew-speaking people here. If I say something wrong, just, just use your mouth and go, eh. Okay. Uh, turn the page. All right. I told you we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna just focus in on that one word, the first word, the word that is magnified. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God led the early sages to magnify it because it's saying there's some mysteries here there's some secrets here you've got to look at this so guess what we're going to do this morning we're going to look at it bet the ideograms that's what they mean the letters of the ancient alphabets it means the house now if it's magnified it means god's household or the house of god the first letter starts off speaking of the house of God. Remember I told you we were going to go into the house of God? Just watch. The first letter. Magnified. And besides, the context of Genesis 1-1 means all that too. So that's not a stretch at all. The resh means, that's a letter, and it, and it can, if just used alone as a, as a symbol of, of an idea, the ideogram, it means the head or the first fruits or the firstborn. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is the head of the church, first fruits from the dead, and the firstborn from heaven. The Aleph means the first, the greatest, and the invisible God, Yahweh. In other words, he's not invisible in his realm, but to us he is. We're like the fish at the bottom of the sea. We are all invisible to the fish at the bottom of the sea, but we're here. Everybody with me? The sheen. That one letter also stands for God, and it stands for the Almighty. You've heard me say before, El Shaddai. In fact, I've used it several times this morning. Well, El Shaddai is too long to write out if you're going to put it on the mezuzah. You know what a mezuzah is. It's that scripture box that a lot of Orthodox Jews and even Christians have it posted on their doorpost of their homes or their businesses. Can you see that right in the middle? It's hard to see from way back there. It's a sheen, okay? It just means the Almighty God. The ideogram is the consuming one, the destroyer. That's the first few. But what it means is the Almighty, the Almighty. He can speak and consume the earth. He can call down fire from heaven, and it's done, As Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody with me? The Almighty, El Shaddai. There's the Yud, which means the hand, and the Tav means the covenant or the sign or the cross. It's in the shape of a cross. Bet, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Ta. If we use ideograms in that order, turn the page. Here's what it says. The house or the household of God or the house of God, the Bet, of the firstborn, the head, Resh. That would be Yeshua. The invisible God, Aleph, who is the almighty, Shin, by his hand, Yud, was established the covenant of the cross, Tav. That's in the first word, using ideograms. I'm going to go much deeper than that, though, in just a moment. All right? Turn the page. Now let's look at Hebrew word discoveries within Bereshit. These are actual words. When you take the first letter and the last two, it spells house, bayet. But it's the magnified, which means it's the house of God. Now what I've done, I've included scriptures along the way. And the reason I've done that is just to show you that these are Hebrew words. And I'm going to pronounce them as best I can with my Gentile accent. But I'm going to pronounce them, and you will see them, and they're in the pronunciation. And I've listed those scriptures so you can just go see examples. These words sometimes are used dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Some of these words are just used maybe five or six or seven times. But they're all used in the Bible as you see them here. And they are all in the first word of the Bible. And more these five are just the beginning. House, 
take that and that. But look what's in the house. That's interesting. We'll find out what that means in just a moment. The resh shin. Excuse me. Resh aleph shin. What is that? That's a Hebrew word too. We'll see it in a moment. In the house. All right. The first two letters and the last two is the covenant. What's in the middle there? Well, <laughs> that's a Hebrew word, but it's also ideograms. It's the Aleph and the Sheen. It's God who is the Almighty, who's the one that establishes the covenant. Do you see that? All right. Take the first two letters of Bereshit. All right. That spells the sun, S-O-N, bet-resh, bar, bar, all right? That's an archaic word for sun. It's used mainly poetic or to emphasize the special. It's like a term of endearment. Why would it be used? There are several times when Aramaic words are in the Hebrew scriptures. Why? Here's the best way to explain it, and for language experts, please forgive me. I'm trying to simplify it, not for these people, but for me, okay? Aramaic is kind of like Latin is to Italian. It's, it's, it, a lot of people think that the Hebrew kind of developed, the modern Hebrew developed kind of out of the Aramaic. Most scholars believe that Jesus spoke Aramaic. Or it could have been Hebrew, and the two were closely related. A lot of scholarship on the Internet explains it like this. The Aramaic was some of the earliest language spoken by many, many people, but it became kind of the language of business and the upper class. In other words, if you watch movies from the, from the 7, 16, 17, 1800s about all that was going on, Napoleon Wars and all of that, so you had people in Russia spoke beautiful French. People in Great Britain spoke beautiful French. Why? Because French became the kind of the upper crust language, and everybody learned that too because it was kind of the language of business. Like right now, English is the language of business for the world. Okay? So Aramaic was similar to that. So by the time of Jesus' day, most likely Jesus spoke a lot of Aramaic because almost everybody understood that, of, especially of the G uh, Hebrew people. So that word bar is important. Because the Hebrew word, the modern Hebrew word for son is ben, okay? But bar is used eight times in the Old Testament, and it always means a son who is special or a chief or a term of endearment, like Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage against God? They had better kiss the son, that's bar, or the wrath of God will be poured out on. Daniel 7, he said, and I saw one like the son of man approaching the throne of the ancient of days. The word is bar. Does everybody hear me? What's in the first word of Genesis? A special son. A term of endearment. The son I love. Bar. In the house of the covenant. But what did that son do? He bara, the first three letters. What? The whole house of the covenant. And he presides, there's the first four letters, that is the head on top, the ruler. You can look it up here, you can see it used there. And so what this whole f first five revelations, the house of God's covenant with man was created by the son and he presides over it. It's the first word of the Bible, guys. Now do you see why it was magnified, the first letter? But you haven't seen anything yet. Okay, turn the page. Six, seven, eight, nine, and that's not the end of it. Now, let's remove the, the preposition from it, and now you have, as I've said, reshit, which just means the beginning. You put the preposition back in, the bet, it means in the beginning, okay? So there's another word, the beginning. I told you there was something between the bereshit and the cross, the better sheet, and, and, and these two mean the house. What's in the house? There's the word. There's the word. The head. The head of it all. You'll see in just a moment. You know what else is there in these letters? The pillars or the foundation. The head in, is a Hebrew word. Just like, bet, just like reshith is the word for beginning. Rosh is the word for the head. 
pillar or foundation. And there's a lot of words used for this, but, but this is specifically is in here, and it's ashuyet, and Jeremiah 50, 15 has it used there. All right, now let's go back and put the bet in, the house of God, and what we discover. <laughs> Not only is the head there, but the last two letters, the aleph and the sheen, is a Hebrew word, and it means fire in the house of God, in the belly of the house of God, is the head and the one that controls the fire from heaven. And guess what we're supposed to be? The holy word place that brings down God's fire of his word. There's supposed to be fire in a church. Y'all hear me? Amen. Metaphorically, there's supposed to be fire among us. We hear churches and Christians all the time saying, Lord, bring down your fire. Fill us with the fire of God. Fill us with, well, what are they talking about? The first word of the Bible declares that's who we are. That's what we're supposed to be. The fire of God. We bring the fire of God's word. What does fire do? It purifies. Paul writes about that. The purifying fire of the beam of seat judgment. Next slide. This is cool. Now you come to these last four letters. What mystery is hidden within the Aleph Tah of Bereshit? Okay, well, what I'm asking is, near the end of Bereshit is the Aleph and the Tah. The Aleph and the Tah. What's the Aleph and the Tah? That's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's a picture of God. Well, what's in that structure of the Aleph and the Ta. Well, the first thing you find is the sheen. The ideogram is the Almighty God. On the cross, because here's the cross, but the, the excuse me, the, yeah, the sheen and the Tav, all right, the ideogram would be the Almighty God on the cross. El Shaddai, Zechariah 12 says, You will look upon me who is pierced, and you will mourn for him as an only son. That is declared in the first word of the Bible. In between the Aleph and the Ta is Almighty God who's on the cross. The actual Hebrew word with Sheen Tav is appointed, is pronounced shot. It's used in Genesis 4.25 in that exact way. Then you stay in there and you take these two letters. They're right there in the middle between the Aleph and the Ta. In the ideogram, it means the hands of the Almighty and the actual Hebrew word for that is gift. The appointed gift of God is right in the first word. Who's the appointed gift? Yeshua, who went to the cross. Everybody with me? This is the first word. We haven't even gone to any of the other words, and we're not this morning. We're just staying in the first word. So what do these Hebrew word discoveries, these 11 Hebrew word discoveries, add up in a message? Turn the page. From the beginning, the Son is the creator, the firstborn head, the hand of the Almighty, and the foundation and pillar of the covenant household of God. That's the body that brings forth the fire of heaven. Yeshua is God's appointed gift from the beginning by going to the cross in order to establish the new covenant with his creation. Therefore, he alone presides over it. Amen. Now, the reason I started off with the Apostle Paul in the synagogue, desperately trying to show the Jewish people, I'm convinced either he showed them this stuff here, he might not have had a PowerPoint, I don't, I don't think he did. When was that invented? Was it? Okay, but anyway. But he knew how to preach it and he knew how to teach it. And just in case you're going, now, Carl, that's a stretch. Hang on. Not a stretch at all. What you just read right there, Paul wrote every bit of it. Some of it in segments, some of it all together. The only way Paul could have written that would be if he knew what I just showed you. 
Well, how could he know that? First of all, he's got the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Second of all, he belongs to, to, the, to God through Yeshua now. Thirdly, he was a rabbi, very familiar with the scriptures. Fourthly, the ancient rabbis and even modern rabbis are obsessed with looking at meanings of letters, especially the magnified letters and anything that might go with them. Um, they're, they're obsessed with it. Paul probably was. But also, Paul gives his testimony that the risen Lord appeared to him from time to time over the next years, showing him these things. Well, why would he do that? For the same reason after the resurrection, that same Yeshua came from the grave, risen Lord, appeared to his disciples many times over 40 days and over and over and over. And if you've read my latest book, I give you all the examples where he it says he showed them everything about himself from the scriptures. So the apostle Paul knew what you just got shown. And it's not just him. John knew it. Peter knew it. They all use those words. But I want you to see, especially the Apostle Paul, who wrote half the New Testament and the most famous rabbi on the planet. Just look at some stuff. Turn the page. Ephesians 3, 8. Although I'm less than the least of God's people, his grace was given me. I preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Everyone, the administration of this mystery for the ages was kept hidden in God. What's hidden in God? The gift. How would he know that? He saw it. He spoke Hebrew. He knew the letters. He knew. He, he went. He knew. Jesus probably pointed it to him, but when he pointed to him, he saw everything we're seeing. So he writes about it, but this is not even the best one. Okay? The gift. Who created all things. What does is, what is Bereshit say? The words in it? Uh, the son created the house, and he presides over it. God's intent was now that through the church, the holy word place, which we've been t learning about for so long, the deber, coming from the word the debar, meaning the word of God that creates, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known, I love this, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Not only rulers and authorities in the earthly realms, but even among the angels and even among the demons. And that word heavenly doesn't mean in God's heaven. It just means in the unseen realms. He said God's manifold. That means many faceted aspects of his wisdom would now be made known. Guess what I'm doing this morning? Guess what we're doing this morning? We are a part of the Deber, the holy word place. What did Jesus say in the last parable of his kingdom parables? If you're going to be a good steward of the holy word place, you've got to take from the old and the new, put them together, and bring them out to the people and teach it. That's what it says. And we got preachers in pulpits all over the world now, especially in America, saying, we don't need that Old Testament stuff. We need to do away with the Old Testament. Who do you think's behind that? Satan. Satan doesn't want you to know the first word. He don't want you to know any of it. He doesn't want you to know even the first word of the Bible, lest you see this. Okay? You've probably already, excuse me, you've probably already read the rest of it, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, there it is, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gift of God, the gift of God. Why would, he, why would Paul just keep calling it the gift of God, the gift of God? You'll hear it over and over. You might say, well, of course it is. Yeah, but Paul didn't know that when he was struck down. What, what, where do you get that? It comes from the first word, right between the Aleph and the Ta. Who is God, the Almighty, whom Paul would have known that? He would have known Isaiah, where God says, I am the first, I am the last. Now he knows about Jesus saying, I am the first, I am the last, I'm God in the flesh. Paul knows all that. He goes back to the first word. He finds the Aleph and the Ta in the first word, and right in the middle of it is the gift and if you use the other two letters from it, the appointed gift. That's why Paul would write in Galatians 4.4, 4, and at just the right time, God sent forth his son to deliver us from sin. What time? The appointed time. Where did he get that from? It's in the first word. The whole gospel is in the first word. The whole word of God is in the first word which is why the first letter of the first word is magnified in the Torah scrolls to this day in the synagogues. Amen. The first letter. Ephesians 
1, 9 through 10. And so God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed, appointed, determined in Christ to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven together under one head, one rosh, even Christ. Okay, turn the page. More. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens and saints, the members of <laughs> the household of God. That's from the first letter, first word. Built on the foundation. That's from the first word. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. That matches with the foundation from the first word. In whom the whole structure, the structure of what? The house of God, the, the, the bayet, grows into a holy temple or the holy word place or the naos in Greek or the deber in Hebrew, in the Lord. In him you are being built together as a dwelling place for God by his spirit, which is why Paul would say over and over, don't you know you are the temple of God? And he used the word naos, meaning the holy word place. All of that Paul got from the very first word. All right, First Timothy chapter 3. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you, so if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church, the household of the living God, a pillar and foundation of truth. Where'd Paul get all that from? First word in the Bible. But now, the next one is my favorite. I've quoted this over and over. It's a whole chunk from Colossians. Turn the page. And it's filled with all the words from the first word. In the Bible, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. He's the one that hung between heaven and earth. And the rest of Genesis 1 1 speaks that's what he created visible and invisible. Whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before. Reshit in the beginning, before all things, and in him all things hold together, the pillar and the foundation. He is the head of the body, the rosh, the church, the household of God, the bayet. He is the beginning, reshit, and the firstborn, firstfruits, the rosh, from among the dead, so that in all things he may have preeminence, the head, the one that presides. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to the world, things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his tav, the cross. Everything that's in the first word is right there in Colossians chapter 1. How did Paul know that? Because what I showed you this morning, either he knew it and the Lord showed it to him, just like he showed the disciples. The Bible says he showed them everything. See, all of this would sound like a fairy tale, except all of that was written 2,000 years ago. And we're looking at it today with our own eyes. My question is, do you have the eyes to see? And what difference is it going to make in your life? Turn the page. Watch this, just a little clip from John, and there's so much more. So it's always been about this, the Bereshit. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'eretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but it all starts with the first word. It's all about this. Look what John said. Bereshit was the Dabar, and the Dabar was with Elohim, and the Dabar was Elohim. He was with Elohim in the beginning. Through him, all things were created. What does the first word say? It's the Son that created. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The Dabar became flesh. And made his dwelling, his deber, the holy word place, among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Bar, son, who came from the Father. The first word declares all of that. John knew it too. How would John know it? Because he was one of the disciples that Jesus sat with for 40 days. 
And the Bible says, showed them everything about him. You want to know some of the stuff that Paul was preaching when he went into those synagogues 2,000 years ago? This stuff right here. Their jaws hit the ground. A lot of Jews were saved. You know what Acts says? Priests were saved. You know what else Acts says? Rabbis were saved. You know what else Acts says? A lot of Gentiles, especially God-fearing Gentiles that, that, who had already come to understand that Yahweh was the creator. A lot of them were in the synagogues trying to learn more and more until Jesus comes and he dies and he goes to the cross and he rises from the dead. And a lot of them are still in the synagogue saying, well, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't need all that Jesus stuff. I don't. And then along comes Paul. And he shows them what you saw. And they say, oh, my gosh. And they call upon Yeshua. The first word, I want you to hear this. I'm not, I, I'm not overstating this or overemphasizing it. The first word in the Bible is about you. He sent his appointed gift so that you could be saved. He sent him from the house of God. He said, well, where's that? All right. John wrote this. He remembered it. He was there. John chapter 14. You believe in God? Believe also in me. For in my Father's house, <laughs> there's the house of God, are many dwelling places. I know the King James says mansion, but that's not the word in the Greek. And it goes to the Hebrew word that means dwelling places. What did Paul say? So that we could dwell with him in the house of God forever. We call that heaven. But then we get all this comic book, children's ethereal stuff in our head about what heaven is. It's not fat little babies playing harps on angels. I mean, on clouds. That's, that's not, are y'all listening to me? It's not that. It's the house of God. What's the house of God? It encompasses and fills the universe and any other universes that have been made. All the realms, the unseen realms, the seen realms, everything was created by him and for him. And we were supposed to have it from the beginning and Satan took it from us. And God is restoring it through Jesus Christ, the covenant. And you know what else the Bible says about Jesus? <laughs> says it in Revelation, says it in 1 Peter. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. You know what we read in the first word of the first verse? He's the creator of the house of God. He's the one that brought the covenant and went to the cross. That means before the foundation of the earth, it was already planned. And it was planned for you. Not just for you, but for you. How could anybody see all of this and not bow their knee to Yahweh, El Shaddai, Elohim, Yeshua HaMashiach, Adonai, Ariel, Yudah? How could they not exclaim, Gadol Adonai, great is the Lord. How could they not exclaim, Nehalelka, we worship you. Only if you have eyes to see. I pray this morning that if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never followed him in believer's baptism. You saw DJ do that this morning. Beautiful. Just She's just wearing the wedding band of salvation now. Jesus presented himself for baptism. He didn't need to be baptized. He's the groom. We're the bride. But the groom put the ring on first. Now he says, all those that follow me, put the ring on. Because in my father's house are many dwelling places. Oh, you don't know about the Father's house? Go to the first letter in the Word of God. It's magnified. Then do a search of the first word. And you will see, I've known this from the beginning. And I want to include you. But you're not a puppet. You're not a robot. You're not an animal. You have freedom of will. You can choose. 
God's a gentleman. He will not manipulate you. Satan will manipulate you. Have you ever felt that before? He will lie to you. He will drag you down to keep you out of the bayet, the household of God. The choice is yours. I wish I could make it for you. The fire of heaven is going to fall. It's going to fall soon, guys. I don't set dates. I don't know when. But the judgment of God is on its way. Oh, valleys be raised up. Oh, mountains be laid low. Uh, Ariel Yudah, the Lion of Judah, is on his way. The Lamb of God has already done his work. Now, the Lion of Judah is on his way. If you're not right with the Lord today, get right with him. We'll have counselors down here. We'll have prayer ministers. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.